official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. In Puerto Rico, the K-12 school system is still reeling from the effects of Hurricane Maria two years ago. Now another storm has hit, but this time it's political. Education Secretary Julia Kelleher has resigned and is facing indictment on corruption charges. Mark Kyerleber of The 74 is following the story, and he joins us now. Mark, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks, Emma. Well, first of all, give our listeners a a quick synopsis, if you can, of, of Puerto Rico's education system for those who may not be familiar with it. Puerto Rico's education system has been in the midst of rapid change for years, long before Hurricane Maria devastated the schools in September of 2017. Much of that change stems from a decade-long recession and debt crisis that's led to major population loss on the island, which in turn has left fewer students in its classrooms. In fact, enrollment in Puerto Rico's public schools has decreased uh, by nearly half over the last decade, and the hurricane brought a significant uptick in out-migration in the last two years. So how many students are there right now? Right now, there are roughly 300,000 students and they attend about 850 schools across the island. Now that's a significant drop in the number of schools as well, because as a result of you know the hurricane and the out-migration on the island, about a quarter of the island's public schools have closed. So just for comparison's sake, that would make Puerto Rico roughly the fourth or fifth biggest district in the country. Right, well, that's what's really interesting about Puerto Rico. It's long been considered one of the largest school districts in the country, and that's because of an interesting distinction between the public education system on the island and that in states across the country, with the exception of Hawaii, because Puerto Rico operates basically as its own school district. You know, it's uh, the Puerto Rico Department of Education is that state-level education department and is also, you know, its local school district. Now, I will say that part of the changes that have taken place on the island in the last few years is that they created seven regions within the education department to kind of decentralize decision making. How does the funding or oversight of Puerto Rico schools differ from a typical U.S. state? Certainly, you know, they have to comply with the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, like another state. One thing that does differ about Puerto Rico is that it has a really high population of lower income students. And as such, um, it does receive an outsized percentage of its funding from uh, Title I. Well, let's turn for a moment now to to Julia Kelleher. She came in, you know, sort of blazing a trail, promising major reforms, big changes and improvements for Puerto Rico schools. But now she's under indictment. What are the allegations? Essentially, she's being accused of engaging in a corrupted bidding process. And it's important to note a few things here. One, she's pleaded not guilty. So it's still unclear, you know, the outcome of that. But also important to note that this is something that began actually, according to the indictment, the month that she became education secretary, which was a few months prior to Hurricane Maria. So basically, she's being accused of helping people with personal and political ties here, federal education department grants. How unusual is this for Puerto Rico politics, or more specifically for its education leadership, to be facing this kind of a, a legal threat? Well, that's what's you know somewhat interesting about this case, and is somewhat interesting with former Secretary Kelleher in particular. Uh, leading up to the charges, she had portrayed herself as somebody who was on the island fighting, you know, a long battle of corruption within its education department. In fact, she's not even the first education secretary in Puerto Rico to face somewhat similar charges. In the early 2000s, another former education secretary faced uh, and was ultimately convicted of a, a similar corruption scandal. So there is some, some history involved here. Possibly, I mean, because it is a territory and not a state, Puerto Rico just doesn't get a lot of attention from mainstream media. Why did you want to report this particular story? You know, I think that that's exactly part of the reason. After the hurricane hits the island in 2017, it was hugely disruptive to its education system. I mean, schools were closed for months. You know, hundreds of them never actually opened again. 
And so I saw that as, you know, obviously, if you look at what happened in New Orleans in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, where a lot of education reforms kind of swept the system there, I saw this as a potential, you know, there. In fact, it's something that at the time Secretary Kelher was was talking about, making comparisons to New Orleans. So I think the fact that it didn't receive a lot of attention was a motivating factor for me to cover it and to actually continue to cover it because Hurricane Maria did generate a lot of, you know, national coverage, but that coverage kind of fades away. So it was it was great to, you know, really follow the education reforms that did ultimately unfold in the wake of the tragedy. I want to talk about Joy Kelleher and talk about school choice, because that was one of the things she was talking about early in her career as education secretary. And certainly that accelerated after Hurricane Maria. What was she proposing? She was basically hired by the now former governor as an education reformer. She had worked in Puerto Rico as a contractor and as a former U.S. Department of Education official prior to becoming education secretary. And she was essentially brought to the position as somebody from the outside who was willing to change the system. And it's pretty wide ranging. I mean, certainly the changes that have received the most attention are the introduction for the first time in Puerto Rico of charter schools and private school vouchers. But there are also other, you know, more bureaucratic changes like, you know, the seven regional districts and the introduction of basically a, a per pupil funding formula in Puerto Rico. But certainly the, the the most controversial one and the one that's received the most attention by me and by folks on the island is the introduction of school choice. When that happened, it received, you know, a lot of pushback from folks within, say, like the teachers unions who really felt that they were going to completely change the public education system and go in the way of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And at this point, that hasn't happened. In fact, as I was talking with her about the new education law, introducing charter schools, she always seemed a little bit hesitant to say, you know, we're going to completely revamp the system. She was always really persistent with the idea that they were going to try to scale this up rather slowly, that they didn't want to rush into it. With the opportunity for school choice to come into Puerto Rico with the education secretary in favor of it, it sounds like it would be a natural fit for companies from the mainland to make that trip over there. But that didn't happen, did it? You know, as of now, that's not something that we've seen, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a possibility for that to happen. It's actually somewhat interesting as school choice was introduced for the first time in Puerto Rico, there was certainly concern among critics that charter operators were going to come in and kind of take over the system. As of now, that hasn't happened. The sector remains small, but there have been, you know, pushes from folks on the U.S. mainland to open up charter schools in Puerto Rico. And among them is Jeannie Allen, the founder and CEO of the School Choice Group, the Center for Education Reform. She actually, her group actually made several trips to Puerto Rico since Hurricane Maria to learn about the new education reform efforts underway there. And certainly she has a goal of increasing the number of charter schools that exist there. Interestingly enough, I recently interviewed Jeannie for my most recent story on former Secretary Kelleher. And she, to my fascination, talked about how the former secretary didn't seem interested in in opening up the island to a really large charter school sector. In previous conversations with me, the former secretary did talk about how she wanted the charter school sector in Puerto Rico to be what she called like uniquely Puerto Rican and didn't necessarily believe that a charter school operator from, say, Baltimore would be easily just plopped down in Puerto Rico and operate. I mean, for one, Puerto Rico's primary language of instruction is Spanish. So that's a pretty clear distinction between schools throughout the rest of the United States. And, you know, there are also, you know, logistical challenges for the charter operators as well about whether they ultimately see Puerto Rico as you know, a solid place for them to open new schools. 
But there is one mainland charter school operator that's at least considering the move, so I wouldn't rule it out. For many of Puerto Rico's students, the question of school choice comes down to whether to stay or leave the island. We certainly saw a big influx of those students heading to the mainland, particularly to Florida. That's something you've been reporting on for the past couple of years. And there was an aspect of one of your stories that I thought was really brilliant, and that was the welcome displaced educators and families were getting at the airport from Orange County Public Schools. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So... After the hurricane, certainly, you know, like I mentioned, the outmigration from Puerto Rico really intensified and displaced residents were going to places where there were already large Puerto Rican communities, places like Florida and and Massachusetts and New York City. And I actually was really interested at that time, not just about, you know, how the island was recovering from the hurricane, but how it was affecting places far from the eye of the storm, so to speak, Uh, you know, places like Florida. And I was just really fascinated by that, that um, it was a challenge for some Puerto Ricans to land plane tickets. But once they did, they were, you know, headed to, to Orlando. And I talked to school officials in Orange County, in in Orlando, and um, they said that they had this booth set up at the Orlando airport where they were helping kids, you know, with the enrollment process. And to my fascination, actually interviewing teachers who are fleeing Puerto Rico right there in the airport terminal, which, I mean, it was just fascinating. It was kind of a a win-win for a lot of people there. Obviously, great for for teachers fleeing their home and and need new jobs. The Orlando School District, uh, you know, wanted to fill its vacancies. And even Secretary Kelleher at the time, she was talking about closing additional schools. So did they have a job in a few months? That was a little bit unclear. So it seemed like a benefit for her to maybe, you know, have some of those teachers seek work elsewhere as well. We're talking with Mark Kyerleber of The 74 about his coverage of Puerto Rico's public schools. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And if there's a story you'd like to know more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. Mark, some of this reporting is in-depth, but it also has to be done from afar. I think that's a challenge for a lot of our reporter members who are listening right now. So I'd love to hear some advice from you on, on how you address that. How do you bridge that distance? You're right. Reporting from a distance is a bit of a challenge. One of the challenges that I did face in reporting this story is a language barrier in the fact that um, Puerto Rico's public education system, Spanish is their primary language of instruction, and building sources from the the ground up. I hadn't previously reported much or really at all on Puerto Rico, so I, to some degree, was parachuting in, but I still had the benefit of local press, um, which, of course, is always really helpful in understanding the situation there and, and building sources there. You know, one thing that was really interesting is that there hasn't always been a lot of coverage in you know, the national um, media landscape on Puerto Rico. And former Secretary Kelleher really saw that. And she often seemed a little bit stressed by that and was, quite honestly, she became a, a good source and was really willing to at least share her opinion and her perspective on the situation. So having a source there who was the person leading change efforts in Puerto Rico, being willing to discuss what was happening there was one of the benefits. I do just want to give a shout out to some reporting over the last couple of years on Puerto Rico. Um, and that, of course, is Andrew Ujifuza of Education Week, who was able to go to the island with videos and photos by Swikar Patel. That's definitely worth catching up on if you missed that the last time around. So, Mark, let me ask, for reporters who are busy with stories, coverage in their own states, why should they be paying attention to Puerto Rico? What are some of the lessons here? Certainly, one is responding to tragedy. One unfortunate reality is that tragedy can strike again. It's certainly not going to be a same situation, but a lesson to learn here is follow the reforms that follow the tragedy. 
I think that's a good point. I mean, certainly we can look at Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, which swept away the local school boards and, and school districts and almost entirely replaced with charter networks and, and certainly where that comes from. And, and, and Puerto Rico is being vulnerable to that. I do think one of the lessons here for reporters is to keep their skeptical lenses on, and especially when there's a high profile individual who comes into the spotlight, who's making a lot of promises and pledges to enact change. Certainly, we all know the trope about waiting for Superman, or or in this case, waiting for Superwoman. You know, though Puerto Rico is unique in its own right, there are uh, takeaways here for any place that's, um, you know, that maybe doesn't have private school vouchers or charter schools, because they're certainly not unique to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has joined the heated war over the future of public education in America. With regards to what happened in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, it'll be really interesting to see how the reform efforts in Puerto Rico affect student performance on the island and whether the island does take a similar path as New Orleans. Though, as of right now, I'd say it probably hasn't exactly worked out that way. Now, in terms of the waiting for Superman, Always remaining skeptical of anybody, whether they're under indictment or not, is good sound advice. But I, you know, I just do want to say that former Secretary Kelleher was really quite blunt on her observations of public education in Puerto Rico. She really characterized it as a place that was long riddled with poor student performance, with corruption within the public education department and crumbling school buildings even. And she really did see herself as somebody who was going to come in and, I guess, really make a change in the system and hope for the better. What are a couple of story ideas for reporters who may be following your coverage of Puerto Rico and and may want to take some inspiration from that? I guess one thought is to keep an eye on how something that may not even have a direct tie to schools is affecting the kids in those communities. How do uh, teachers address student trauma as a result of, of tragedy? With regard to Puerto Rico in particular, I mean, certainly there will be attention on reform efforts there. Does it become like the next New Orleans? Meanwhile, you know, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Inspector General uh, recently released a report that said that federal disaster recovery money on the island is at risk of abuse. So, you know, I mean, what about other communities? Certainly, Puerto Rico isn't the only one that's receiving federal funds. Does your local community have proper controls in place to ensure that resources uh, from the federal government are being allocated properly? Julia Kelleher is being accused of aiding in a corrupted bidding process. It's always a noble idea to follow the money. You know, where is the money in your community going? Who is getting it? And do any contracts raise uh, possible conflicts of interest? Lastly, as Puerto Rico continues to build its charter sector, it is possible, as we've noted, that charter operators from the U.S. mainland will open a campus on the island. So if you're in a community that's got a a major school choice, a a charter management organization, are they looking to open a campus on the island? And if they do, what does that mean for the network? Mark Kyer Leber is a senior writer reporter for the 74. He's also an EWA awards winner this year for his coverage of campus safety issues. He joined us from his office in New York. Mark, thanks for making time for EWA Radio. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story you want to know more about, drop us a line with radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thank you for listening. Thank you.